PEDAC 2023, day three. And I'm here with the two keynote speakers for the upcoming Critical Minerals Institute Summit in June. Mark Chalmers, of course, from Energy Fuels, and Constantine Karanopoulos from Neo Performance Materials. So we at Investor Intel, we see a lot of announcements about multi-billion dollar investments from governments and hedge funds and investment groups. They want to change the world. And we've been addressing not only the challenge with supply and demand, sustainability, and of course the supply chains, but the actual shortage of people. Now, how are you dealing with the shortage of people? Well, I think the shortage of people is real because it's hard to find uh, process engineers and technical people that have any understanding of how you would recover these rare earths. And, and, and in our case, um, we, we started early in the process. We, we, we linked up and started working with NEO uh, and Constantine's team. This has a long history of, of, of processing and refining and coming up with different products. But at the same time, we had a head start as energy fuels because we have a number of very solid professionals that understand solvent extraction, that are very motivated, very focused, and actually making very big strides in advancing our initiatives. Uh, so, it, but it's still difficult. But I have no idea how companies that have no technical expertise whatsoever, how they're gonna get there without having at least a core nucleus or relationships or partnerships to help them get there. I am certain you have an opinion on this because I recall you telling me years ago, you know, how do these companies make these announcements? They don't even have any relationships. Well, we've, we've talked about this many times, Tracy. Um, there is a, a massive investment gap, a massive resource gap, a massive infrastructure gap, a massive skills gap. And I think in order for all these governments to meet the deadlines that they impose on themselves, and the markets, we need massive uh, investment, first of all, along the supply chain from resource extraction to manufacturing to infrastructure and charging infrastructure in particular. And then industry needs to bridge that skills gap, which is very real. And probably with the exception of China, every advanced economy in the world is facing that skills gap as it's looking to secure both resources, but also the technical and manufacturing infrastructure that it needs to get to the decarbonized vision of 2030, 2035, 2050, whatever the number is. So of course, as you both will be keynote speakers at the CMI Summit, do you have any idea what your favorite theme will be to discuss at that time? Uh, from, from our perspective, from energy fuels, I mean, our theme is going to be progress, right? It's advancing a strategy, we believe, quicker, faster than most companies out there um, by focusing on what Constantine just said. You've got to start with the molecules, you've got to process it, you've got to have the people to do that, and you have a strategy to, to focus on integration. So, so I think, uh, you know, absolutely my focus and my talk will be on attaining integration as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, by combining all those elements that you have to have. You know, you can't, you know, if you have all the expertise in the world, you can't produce rare earths if you don't have the, the molecules to start with. So it's got to be, you got to have all these, 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 these steps established so that you can actually achieve what your objective is. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so what will you be discussing? I don't know, I'll talk about whatever you want me to talk about, but uh, I'd really like to, I guess, provide an update on our uh, uh, expansion in Estonia, where we have Europe's only large commercial rare earth processing facility, uh, and we are uh, building a state-of-the-art magnet facility to supply primarily the European uh, OEMs and tier ones in, in automotive with the magnets they need for the motors that they need, for the drivetrains that they're putting into their electric vehicles, regardless of what Mr. Musk may be thinking or may be aspiring to, per permanent magnets made with rare earths are here to stay and for the next decade at least, and they, at least decade to two decades, they will be the main driver 
of energy efficiency in electric vehicle drivetrains. Well, because of both of your experience, I mean, you've got uh, offices in 10 countries, correct? Correct. Approximately. And of course, you are you know, the red, white, and blue <laughs> of uh, critical minerals. Uh, I'd like if you could just touch on perhaps some of the geopolitical issues presently, starting with Elon Musk's uh, <laughs> uh, impact to the China market when he announced that uh, we can do it without rare earths. Thoughts? Um, I think it's an aspirational comment. Um, when, I, when I ask my extremely bright technical folks about the future of motor design and energy efficient motors, I really don't see any chance that, uh, other than induction motors, you know, the very mature technology uh, that Tesla started with before adopting permanent magnet, uh, permanent rare, rare earth permanent magnet motors, um, I think the, that drive will continue. So for the rest of my career, and probably the next decade, as I said earlier, to the decade and a half or two decades, the rare earth magnet motors will continue to be the most efficient motor that you can put in uh, uh, in an EV. So, and, and Mr. Musk found that out when he started building automobiles in China. Um, he built some of the best EVs, some of the most efficient EVs in the world. Um, in all of the discussions that we're having with our German automotive customers, there's only one option for them and that's the rare earth permanent magnet uh, motor and I'll take the wisdom that comes from very very smart people uh, like that uh, any day of the week. Would you like to add anything to that? Um, no I think that um, you know Constantine is right I mean and it's a big world out there you know if, if one person makes a comment that you know they're not going to need it well there's still another rest of the world out there that needs it right so uh, you know I think that uh, you know, if, if you want the best efficiency, the, 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 the maximum efficiency for electric vehicles with what we know today, you've got to have these permanent magnet motors. So, um, but it is, it's, it's kind of, uh, it was surprising how it moved the market so much on that day. It was a little rocky for a number of companies, but I think we've all pretty much recovered since then. So we're hearing a lot of news here on the floor at PDAC. For instance, I spoke to one exploration junior company, and they're like, they were talking about a large automotive company they were having negotiations with. And it occurred to me, it seems kind of premature. They're many years away from actual production. Uh, but according to Jack Lipton, who's our co-chairman, uh, he believes there's going to be a big transformation for more and more end users, basically, making deals with some of these exploration companies. Do you see that trend uh, occurring? Are you getting, because I would assume everyone's knocking on your door right yeah, it, now. It, it, absolutely, there's a trend there. And, and, um, the, the only cons and I think it's a recognition that you have to have the molecules. And so people are going upstream to secure molecules because there is going to be a shortage of molecules, in my opinion. So, um, but it's also kind of an interesting issue too because the automobile manufacturers and OEMs, that's what they do. And, and they're going into areas that they, they're not typically uh, experienced in or, or, or have a, a, a long history of, of, of going upstream like that. So it'll be very interesting to see how many of those relationships are successful and actually contribute and give them the molecules that they're looking for. Vertical integration is a very tricky business and because it, not, it takes not only unique skill sets if you're trying to move to a different part of the supply chain, but it also takes a different mindset and culture. Just like junior miners and resource types, they, they, they've always historically had a very difficult time making the transition to uh, becoming specialty chemicals producers, which is the case in rare earths. Similarly, people who, uh, companies and, and, and people who can build the best cars in the world, making the transition to becoming resource extractors, it's, it's a completely different game. So I believe the lessons have been learned and I'm hopeful that the automotive companies uh, will do a much better job this time. Uh, however, and, and since you also put it, Tracy, in geopolitical terms, you know, geopolitics is nothing new. I mean. The world has been driven by geopolitics for centuries. Um, so this is just a different manifestation of 
the Europeans and the uh, North Americans seeking resource security in other parts of the world. Now, I guess the industrial, the industrialized West has a bit more competition in the emerging and much more sophisticated East, whether it's Japan, China, Korea. Um, and this is all in the context of a dearth of sufficient molecules, as Mark said earlier, to supply all of these massive opportunities that are manifesting themselves. So I think there's a little bit of panic uh, in some of the boardrooms, um, uh, both in Europe and in North America. Uh, I do see, I've, I've, I've been having discussions with at least two automotive companies that are looking to secure resources both for batteries and for drivetrains. And I think that will become more of a norm. How it's going to be done remains to be seen, but there's no question that there's massive interest in uh, boardrooms of the biggest automakers around the world as to how they will secure the critical raw materials where we don't have enough production right now for, um, for their uh, manufacturing plants and their growth plants. I'd just like to add something. It, you know, we went through this period of the last 20, 30 years of, of, of uh, globalizing, and that was the focus. You know, we would globalize, we'd secure whatever products from wherever we could get it at the lowest cost, and now we're seeing this trend that uh, there's, there's this deglobalization. And, and uh, you know, if you go back into the 50s and 60s, most of the developed world were, were very focused on having those critical supply chains established for their own countries and uh, and that pretty much went away so yeah it's an, an interesting time Tracy to see this evolution that we're in uh, but yeah the bottom line is uh, in order to, to advance this this electrification decarbonization efforts and focus um, we've got to have the molecules and the molecules are the starting point and we have to be able to go through the integration as Constantine says um, to get to the desired outcomes so speaking of outcomes, I think the buzzword at PDAC is ESG. Yeah. <laughs> ESG, we got to have ESG. I watched uh, Chris Rock's monologue last night, and <laughs> even Chris held up his phone and said, we're, we're carrying these phones with child, you know, laborers, right? They obviously, people understand now about rare earths. They understand where you have to find them. They're, 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 the, edu the education that's out there has expanded. So ESG and critical minerals. Thoughts? We've never done more on um, community consultation um, and, and, and we set up a foundation a couple years ago. Uh, we put a million dollars into that foundation. It's in San Juan County where the mill is um, and we're starting to make awards in the foundation. I'm very proud of that. Uh, we also committed 1% of the revenue from the mill um, going forward. Uh, because it's such an important issue and, and we, 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 do, we do more now uh, than we had done decades ago. We probably should have done more, but we are absolutely on top of our game as we're very committed to that as a company and I'm proud that we are. Well, since you, you provided the opening, uh, Tracy, um, my, uh, our um, magnet, magnetic alloys and magnetic powders plant in Thailand uh, just got its uh, goal rating uh, by Ecovadis again. At this time, scoring higher than the last time they got the, the gold uh, designation. Um, at NEO, we're spending more time, effort, and money on ESG programs um, for a couple of reasons. One, it's the right thing to do. Uh, second, our customers all demand it. So, as we speak, there's a very large group of senior managers in the company going over our greenhouse gas reduction strategy here in Toronto with consultants that are helping us along the way. There's no, there's no other way to do it, uh, but we, I, I think the supply chains, and especially here at PDAC, since PDAC represents the very early stages of very long supply chains, there needs to be a seriousness to, that addresses ESG. Uh, in addition to social license, I mean, ESG takes very different manifestations, but this is real and it's important and it's serious. And the risk I see when I see, when I read announcements by various companies, there is a risk of greenwashing just to 
ride the wave uh, without really, with doing as little as possible and getting away with it. That is suicidal. ESG is real and companies need to take it seriously and they need to devote resources, uh, both human and, and capital, towards this. Because when the time comes that all of these companies will be in production and they'll be selling to really demanding customers, um, they will have to present their ESG credentials and they have to be real. Well, clearly we can talk all day long. I mean, we've got two of the top critical mineral experts in the world. So I just want to thank you so much for swinging by today to give us an update. Thank you both. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy.